listening to you are listening to truth over comfort podcast with carlos morales and taryn harris brought to you by the blue ridge liberty project hey everyone this is the truth over comfort podcast my name is carlos morales today we have brett venat a returning guest uh, from school sucks podcast found at school which is kind of the show that inspired me to start uh doing my show completely how are you doing today brett hey carlos thanks for having me on what I want to talk about today was, so I recently spoke with an individual who was looking to pass an anti-bullying law in California, which it looks like is actually going to succeed. Now, the law is about as vague as the term bullying, which is just part of the reason why it's a little horrifying. It includes uh, cyberbullying, uh, which means that typing out a specific text in regards to someone else uh, can now be considered a crime, in fact, a misdemeanor. Essentially, what occurs is if I call Dan a dick on Facebook, uh, first, I get a warning. Secondly, I have forced indoctrinated counseling. And then third, what occurs is if I'm under the age of 18, um, my parents are then fined $100. And this, of course, is kind of the, the, the lightest issue I have with this is kind of how the law am, is implemented. The mm-hmm. biggest issue I have with it is the moral culpability, the moral culpability of kids in this particular scenario. As in, you know, a child is being forced into an indoctrination camp and has very little freedom, right? But somehow they have all the moral responsibility in regards to this context. Um, but the parents and society that has led to this kind of bullying, well, they don't have any kind of moral responsibility at all. And as the host of a show called School Sucks, I imagine, Brett, you have probably some pretty strong feelings in regards to this. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the hypocrisy is really astounding here. I mean, you have, I mean, all the force, like uh, you mentioned one example, there's like, Money is forced away from people to pay for the schools, and then it's used to force the attendance, and once you have attendance, you have forced compliance, you have kids forced to do uh, meaningless production, and obviously, as you and I know all too well, if there is any breakdown in uh, any of that compliance, kids are often uh, forced to take drugs, right? But... Yeah, we never look at, as far as the school's concerned, that's the we in that case, we never want to look at the root causes, right? We want to make it all about the kids. And I think that looking at the root causes in this situation is a little too dangerous, right? Because it's not the students. I mean, obviously I think you know students, especially in high school, have to bear some responsibility for their behavior. But the question has never been asked, why is there so much bullying in this environment? And, you know, people would say, oh, well, this is, you know, goes on on the Internet, too, now. But where does it start? You know, it rarely starts on the Internet uh, when we're talking about teens. It mostly starts in the school. So there's never any questions being raised about the school environment, and I think that's the really important thing here. Yeah, you know, um, Jason Osborne, a uh, constant guest on your show, kind of brought up, he, he showed a picture of, like, there was a stabbing at school, and he goes, well, I don't know why anyone's surprised whenever you stick a bunch of people in prison that violence is going to occasionally occur, right? Because you're putting them in these, these kind of institutions where they're being forced to hang out with this aggregate of masses that they had absolutely no uh, choice to be with uh, arbitrarily, correct? And then they're also stuck with people only their own age, and the biggest thing in here, I think, is forced association. So in normal day-to-day life, hey, I'm at, um, I'm at a party or something, right? And everyone I'm hanging around with are a bunch of dicks. Guess what I do? I don't go hang out with these people again. But in school, you got to do it every single day. And, with that, and so what they're doing is they're going, okay, we're going to put all these different things on top of you, right? Whether it's the indoctrination that's going on, it's the... A course of paternalistic tendencies of, of of teachers as well as the principals involved, basically everyone telling you exactly what's best for you at any given time, and then of course forced association. And whenever you combine these kind of evil different things all together, then what you do is you state, oh well, if you ever get into a fight or if you ever call someone an asshole, well now we're going to go ahead and find your parents, and somehow that's considered rational. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about the forced associations, and uh, I think it's another important question is where do we see forced associations, and what are the social relations like in those places? Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, one example is prison. Now, obviously, that might not be the, you know, the most get-along, uh, socially adept group, 
Um, but there's a lot of what we could call bullying uh, in prison. Uh, the military, which again, also maybe not the best at problem solving, socially adept group of characters there. Uh, but it is, in, even though we have a volunteer army, uh, once you're there, you, those are forced associations. Uh, and the third example is school. One of the questions that I raised on the show is, show me a place where forced associations exist, where people are, there's, are experiencing harmonious social interactions. And, and you don't see many of those places. Not that I can think of. When forced, so you're exactly right. When people are forced to be around one another, they don't get along. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, there was this kind of interesting point uh, because usually what occurs um, whenever you start bringing up these points, right? So the particular person that I was talking to, her name is Priscilla Perez. She's the one who's seeming to be able to get this this law pushed forward. And if, by the way, anyone was having issues finding that earlier video, I had to kind of put it on hold due to some weird political stuff. Um, but what I what commonly is brought up every single time there's an issue, it's well, we ha have to do something, right? But you ignore the root of the issue, you ignore all of history, you ignore all of context, but we have to do something. And it was something that's commonly stated, and in fact, no doubt, that this falls back on the perceived notion that government does what it exclaims it will do. We have more than enough history in the last, I don't know, two weeks to show that that's never true, never mind 10,000 years. And this is what it's all about, though. We have to do something. Well, if that something involves the government, then that will be violent. It will be bullied, whether physically or mentally, into the masses, and in many, many times it's absolutely tragic. Case in point, Child Protective Services, which the person I met, right, this, this lady, Priscilla Presley, she, uh, Priscilla Perez, excuse me, she actually um, has worked against Child Protective Services. She knows exactly what happens whenever the welfare of children is taken in the hands of the government and the excruciating results of that. She has an extraordinary amount of experience with this agency, yet she somehow believes that a law passed for the protection of children will work. It's a mind-blowing case of cognitive dissonance, and actually, after one of the recent, uh, that recent stabbing, that, uh, stabbing and then a couple shots uh, recently yeah. with, that, uh, with that guy, uh, afterwards everyone was stating, we have to do something. We couldn't have known what was going on. Mind you, this guy had a series of fucking YouTube videos talking about how he's going to do this. He wrote a manifesto, he had therapists, he had every single type of altercation in which, you know, we knew, basically they knew something was going to occur. In fact, cops showed up to his house, he had a couple guns and 400 rounds of ammunition after talking about how he's going to kill individuals, and the cops left going, what a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. There's no problem with him whatsoever. And so it's this constant... <laughs> Progressive, <laughs> and like you can actually read their lines. It's it's hilarious. Stephen Molyneux did a pretty good thing on it, though. You no, know, it's just funny that the cops that, that that he was sent there to be like assessed by cops yeah. and they signed off on this guy. I mean, I, does that say something about the the quality of people that the cops are? Does it say something about you know their ability to gauge a threat? Um, or did they walk away? We really liked him. You know, we thought. <laughs> Superficial. He was a womanizer. He was a racist. He had a violent tendency. Uh, we we invited him out. You know, this Friday. To hang out with the we, we actually we offered him a job. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and no, that is certainly um, frustrating. And just to jump in on the, um, you know, I know you know this uh, from working in CPS that you know once a bureaucracy comes into existence, it seems that its primary purpose is to justify its continued existence. So, uh, you know, I think that any good crackdown, uh, we, we will slowly see the broadening of the definition of the offense, right? So, child protective services set up to do um, a very specific type of job to deal with abuse. But as Child Protective Services continues to exist and the people involved have to continue to justify their existence, not only their existence but their growth, uh, we see the broadening of the definition of offense. So it's going to be the same, and, and there's already plenty of evidence for this uh, in the schools with zero tolerance, of course, but I think we'd see the same pattern with bullying if we haven't seen it already. Uh, kids, Two kids get into a play fight in the hall, right? Two 13-year-olds. Uh, roughhousing, you know, because they're horny and they, they don't know what else to do. Um, and they both get charged 
with bullying each other. Yeah, no, you know? that's a big issue with the bullying epidemic is that it's conflating a wide variety of different actions into the same category. So physically assaulting and calling a kid a fatty are two very different things, but they're under the same category of bullying. And as you mentioned, we saw this in that early campaign, the zero, you know, zero tolerance laws, which should have been called, you know, zero finesse, zero understanding, zero empathy, zero context laws. Right. And I actually have some fantastic examples. You brought them for your show, but for people who don't know, they're pretty insane. There was a child expelled from school for holding a piece of fried chicken like a gun. Right. Mm -hmm. In Colorado Springs, a six-year-old suspended under the school's zero tolerance uh, law for drug policy when the boy gave another student a cough drop. Oh, shit, that menthol's just as bad as oxycodone. In another Colorado case in Greeley, three boys face expulsion under zero tolerance for gun policy law because they were seen playing with squirt guns. In Canada, an eight-year-old boy was suspended from his elementary school for, again, another breaded chicken incident, but this time the kid said bang. In Alabama, a kid was uh, actually expelled a few days um, before graduation because he left a butter knife in his car that he accidentally left there from helping his grandmother move. So when people state, you know, oh, you're taking this too far, this bowling law thing, it's very, even the woman who was, you know, bringing something, she goes, no, we have 86 pages on exactly what bowling is, and don't worry, they're not going to cross the borders too much, they're not going to state anything else, and it's just this ignorance of law, which also comes from the public schools. So can I ask you a little bit about, I don't know how much you can talk about it, if you can, it's okay, but um, was there something new and different and exciting and progressive, and I mean progressive in the sense of like moving forward, not what it means politically, um, about this law that this woman was proposing? Okay, so she, uh, okay, so the law, right, the law is being passed through this group called JAB, right? Which is, which is called Jade Against um, Beatings, or something like that, right? And so against, essentially what they did was they took this young girl who had been being bullied repeatedly, right, um, in her school, and, her, and she wasn't really receiving any help. She wasn't really helping herself out. I mean, she was trying to do certain things. Apparently, she was too worried to tell her parents, but according to her, they're great parents, right? And so her... She, uh, her, this Priscilla woman was really, really close to her, and Priscilla has a radio show. She has all these other things. So basically, it was one of those things where it's like, she's inspired, and guess what? Now we have a kid that we can use in order to pass this law. So if you're not for this law, then you hate kids. You hate Jade. You hate this person, and pretty much. The majority of progressivist laws are done on the backbone, on, on the coattails of dead kids, of abused kids. They do it all the time. And that, that's, that, to me, was what was so abhorrent here. And, of course, the media right now is carrying out this kind of youth bashing, as they've kind of always done. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's something that we followed on the show, obviously, for years. We did an entire series of shows called Kids Are Not Defective. And um, youth really seem like, uh, as far as the politicians in the media are concerned, to be just a, a fantastic scapegoat because they're voiceless. And, you know, generation after generation, people say, oh, what's wrong with these kids today? So because people don't, you know, recognize changes in cultures or changes from generation, uh, the, the youth often seem very alien to the older generation, who is typically not big fans of change, so it's easy to form this adversarial relationship uh, with younger people, especially if you've raised younger people. That's a tremendous challenge. So there's actually a lot of like quiet resentment from the older generation to the younger generation, but I think the most important thing in the political or mass media context is that kids can't fight back. Yeah, and 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 that I mean that goes back a long time, but there's still residuals of of the voicelessness of children uh, in the conversation today. So um, they're they're an easy scapegoat. 
You know, and he brought up that point about, um, you know, they, they, they brought in the scope repeatedly. And that happens with institutionalizations where there's no financial incentive to end the problem. So this yeah. kind of, this kind of uh, Stefan and a lot of other people kind of bring this up with feminism. Whenever feminism kind of became institutionalized by universities, then it was, well, generally, whenever you have a campaign, it's about a campaign about trying to end something. But whenever you just continue to use the word patriarchy, then it gets broader and broader and broader, then it never really ends because the money keeps up funneling in. And the same thing is happening with bullying in this particular case. So no matter what, they'll always state that there's some particular type of bullying going on while never taking the camera and turning it back on themselves without ever quite realizing the fact that, well, what are some of the biggest bullies out there? Well, government, right? Because the government bullies individuals into funneling money to them, and if they don't give it to them, they throw them in cages. That's about as good a bullying as I've ever heard of. Parents who are abusive bully their children and say, if you don't do this particular thing, I no longer love you. Right? That's a bit, you're admonishing them. You know, what the, you know what a huge bully thing is? Oh, yeah, no. Go ahead and stay right there. You know what? I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you here. You, you are basically telling your kid, I'm going to abandon you. All right? That's yeah. bullying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, that's why the schools can only target the symptoms. And I, I, I think most people, I mean, most people in, who work in schools are participating in this bullying conversation or enforcing these rules. They're like, we can never get at the root cause because then we'll be exposed. Most of them are just, from my experience, they're just, you know, obedient and, and somewhat thoughtless about this. They, you know, allow the definitions to be set for them, and they don't have many questions after that. You know, they're not doing a real in-depth critical thinking process about what's going on, and people aren't encouraged to look at, at the root causes. And, um, you know, this metaphor comes to mind. Uh, if I can borrow the language and the thinking of the, of the central planners and the educationists and the scientific managers of society, uh, school is viewed by them as a production line, right? And you would think that if you keep getting these defective malformed products off the end of the line, according to them, right? Like we have non we have noncompliance. We have bullies. These are defective products. That you would shut down the whole line and go back as far as you need to to find the problem. But all they're concerned about with this anti-bullying legislation is how do we stop the defective thing from falling off the end of the conveyor belt? Yeah, right? it reminds me of that, uh, that Louis C.K. bit on his show whenever uh, they're having like a PTA meeting and they're all talking about how we can get kids to comply and how we can prevent uh, people, for, uh, make sure kids are going to school and everything else. And Louis C.K. just goes, but what about school sucks? Everyone knows it. School's terrible. It's awful. You know, and, and everybody's just like, uh, we're not supposed to state that out loud. I got, I got some stats here because I found this really interesting. How pervasive is bullying? So according to a survey in 2011, trends show that the share of young people affected by digital abuse has declined since 2011. This uh, the study was released in 2012. With less than half, 49% of those surveyed stating they have experienced digital abuse compared to 56% in 2011. Additionally, Virtually every form of digital abuse tracked in the study, 26 out of 27 listed, has declined. When experiencing digital abuse, 44% of young people stated that they seek help from their parents or family, up over 25% from 2011, and the majority, 66%, said that their parents made the situation better. On top of this fact, public shootings are actually down, school violence is down, in fact, violence over the whole course is actually down which again kind of speaks to, and this is just going to lead to it, and you know it is because you always bring, you've always brought this up many times. Things are getting kind of better, and then the state decides, okay, now we're going to pass a law, and then they're going to take, they're basically going to say, look, if we weren't around, yeah. then this wouldn't have went down. Oh, I would thought they would, say, they would, they would start to see the trend towards uh, you know, a better way and jump in and kind of ride that upward. Yeah. You're like, yeah, welcome. Here we are. Yeah. yeah. They they well, need time. I mean, like, so and and in that uh, so youth bashing uh, was that I think it was one of the name of the episodes that you had where you were interviewing a guy named Mike uh, Males. Yep. An individual wrote in uh, in bashing youth. That was the name of the article here. 
Today's media portrayals of teens employ the same stereotypes once openly applied to unpopular racial and ethnic groups. Violent, reckless, hypersex, welfare draining, obnoxious, ignorant. And like traditional stereotypes, the modern media teenager is a distorted image derived from the dire uh, fictions promoted by official agencies and interest groups. And one of the points that he brings up there is teenage pregnancy. Oh no, it's on the rise. And of course it has not been on the rise. And the vast majority of teenage pregnancy is not teen on teen fucking, right? No, it's actually 15 year olds having sex with 30 year olds. That's where a good chunk of it's actually coming. But you don't bring up the adults in this particular case. You just blame MTV. It's that goddamn MTV. They're too busy, you know, uh, having sex and everything else because of what they're watching. It's always this kind of progressive uh, manipulation thing. You see this in documentaries too. Sure. So, well, the article that you wrote, the, the article, or sorry, the article that you read. Uh, was written when I was 17. Really? Right, so I'm 36 now. That, so isn't that funny that they're saying the exact same things, and that's why I shared it on the show. Um, I think Mills wrote the the bashing youth. And I might have. There, there's also Robert Epstein, who people should check out. I think he wrote a book called The Case Against Adolescence. Uh, Mike Mills has been at this obviously for over 20 years. Uh, he's a He's a, he's a lefty, but he's a, a real ally in this, um, you know, trying to give a voice to, to young people, especially in the context of school, politics, and media. Uh, but that was written when I was 17, and it could have been written yesterday, right, if you just make some subtle changes. I mean, I remember the conversation that was going on then. We didn't have the Internet, really, you know, it, anything like it was today, so it was... NWA, it was MTV, it was um, Marilyn Manson. You know yeah. that that when I was a, when I was a teen, uh, that's where the blame was going. But it's always something besides society and again the environments into which kids are forced. Yeah, no, it it, it went from it went from I, I don't know. Let's let's just go. Say Elvis, Beatles, Marilyn Manson, Miley Cyrus, right? So it doesn't matter which generation you're in; they're gonna blame the youth or the the how easily manipulated they are by media. Which, of course, public school has a lot to do with. Is it makes it sound like they're doing a pretty shite job. But this is a typical, you know, liberal cause, and and that fits their narrative. That oh, thank goodness for us. People are so helpless. You know, any any group that is uh, voiceless or helpless, here we are, um, you know, to save the day. So I, I think there's a lot of that going on. And, and, and in, in order for that to work, you have to have uh, this aggressive force against youth, youth, whether it's Marilyn Manson or MTV or violent video games or the Internet, right? And so... When uh, I remember there was a student, her name was Phoebe Prince. She was killed. Uh, she killed herself, excuse me. She came home from school and hung herself after she had been bullied pretty extensively and pretty viciously for a while. Um, there were no questions raised about the school or the, the lack of response at the school when people complained about how this girl was being treated, when she sought help from people in the school. They went right and blamed uh, social media. You know, they said that was the problem. If it wasn't for social media, this girl would be uh, alive. Yeah, there was a there was a meta analysis done of quite a few studies in which they showed that the vast majority of people who are bullies and are bully themselves have been abused at home, which is like such a duh fucking moment, right? Yeah. People are treated badly. Tend to one either. I mean, actually, both cases: the bully, the person being the bully, and the person being bullied generally have bad social interaction, bad social skills in general. Uh, also, you know, on top of already being placed in all the, the, uh, the hierarchical institutions, which we've already been uh, kind of uh, discussing here, and, you know, it's just this, it's, you know, it's, it's more kind of towards the youth bashing thing, and it's also, again, though, it's the progressivism. It's progressivism in, this, in the sense of we need to progress society while ignoring the roots of all causes. So... Let's take a particular incident, and this is kind of outside of this, but it, it does kind of play a part into it. If you watch pretty much any documentary, right, either about kids or about diet or anything else, usually what it is is 
look how stupid and prone to manipulation and and uh, everyone else is, right? Except us. We're the smart ones, right? So they're like, well, you know, in order to prevent kids from getting fat, we need to ban McDonald's ads. Who drives the kid to McDonald's? Someone right. has to actually physically drive the kid to McDonald's, right? But there's no responsibility on the parents. It's always, well, the government has to do this. So I remember watching Food, Inc., and, you know, they brought up some of the points regarding, you know, corn companies are being subsidized and all these other things. But at the end, they, there's a bunch of guys basically stating, we need government subsidization of organic foods. What? Ah. I mean, yeah. we reviewed a uh, we reviewed this uh, documentary, maybe a hundred episodes on my show, and it was made by a liberal group, and um, I think it was called Consuming Kids. I, I want to say that that was I, I can look it up, but um, so we did a whole analysis of this show, and their take on it was very interesting. They said the problem is the advertising. And it all started when Ronald Reagan <laughs> lit some kind of regulation uh, and, advertised, and that allowed them to start preying on kids. Yeah. So you know, the documentary, it's, it's, it's tragic because the documentary made so many good points about here are things that are going on. Here are things that you need to um, look out for. Um, and, and really showed how slimy some of these advertising people were and how they 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 just they didn't even view kids or their parents as people but just more like targets um, but then I remember that one thing where they were talking about following kids like videotaping kids at all times like including in the bathroom or something like that I remember yeah. I remember you talking about that yeah yeah so they kinda as far as like uh, you know their attempt to be prescriptive uh, they lost. Uh, they lost me there, but it's it's not a bad documentary. It does it does make some some good points. Well, another documentary that just pissed me off, and it was a, another co-host for the show. Taryn Harris told me about it. She was like, "Oh, I cried while watching this. I cried out of anger, though, of a different sort." It was the movie Bully, right? I don't know if you watched that. Uh, I didn't say that no. Oh, but yeah. So they 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 they. They go with these kids, and they're like, look at these kids are being bullied in public school. They never really mention the problems of public school. I mean, you actually see, like, the vice president and the teach, I mean, vice, vice principal and the teachers being bullies in the movie, but they never really grab onto that. Um, one of the kids, uh, they're interviewing a parent who had their child had killed themselves because of bullying, and basically it's this whole big sh charade about essentially exactly like this bullying law, and of course... I had a pretty good feeling that it was going to be bullshit because Oprah backed it, you know? <laughs> you know Oprah's never going to back? The War on Kids. That's a documentary that actually hits on the problems, that actually brings up the institution of public schooling, has John Taylor Gatto in it. I mean, it's an amazing documentary, and at the end of it, they, they don't even really offer a prescription at all. It was just like, isn't this fucking terrible? And then Yeah, and yeah. This is happening. Yeah. And and that's that's just one of those things that just kind of blew my mind. And honestly, when it comes to it, anti-bullying laws towards children is an ass-backwards, non-contextual, victim-blaming, and insane idea. It's one of the craziest ideas since sticking 30 children in a classroom where they have to sit, stand, and be quiet at the behest of an individual that has been told that all children learn and think the same, that questioning the fundamental principles of an immoral institution is counterproductive to progress, and those who oppose are to be codified as oppositional and therefore must be ostracized, shamed, and if need be, drugged for it. Uh, well, that, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to second something that you said when you called it uh, victim blaming. You know, a, a sound bite that I've used again and again is obviously every bully, and you said it sounds just like, why is there even any, that's not revelatory at all. Every bully is somebody else's victim, right? And... I remember, I mean, I have witnessed, not just from my time in school, but also uh, my time working in school, I've witnessed a lot of bullying, you know? And if I walked up to a kid who was bullying another kid, and I said, why are you doing this? The kid couldn't give me a bad answer, you know? They, they, they couldn't give me anything. And, and it happened. I said, why do you do that? And, and you know, usually it would just be like, 
geez, that's a good question. I, I have no fucking idea why I, I do that. <laughs> uh, but they wouldn't say anything. And then they would try to say, oh, well, he started it. You know, I mean, that's all they have. And that's like the oldest recycled crap in the world. Uh, kids are doing this, I think, to, to manage trauma and to act out stored aggression. And I think in most cases, it's unconscious. And, and those um, contained or, or constrained environments just lend themselves so well to that type of behavior. But it's about something. There's a reason why people behave that way. Um, and, 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 you know, I think a lot of the bullies, they, they want control. You know, like, why do kids who are popular jocks from wealthy family, why are they bullying kids, right? Because outside of that situation, what do they control? And I'm not saying that they're, they're, we need to pay a tremendous amount of sympathy uh, to them at the expense of their victims, but they're victims too. Outside of that interaction where they found the weaker kid or the less popular kid that they can bully, what are they in control of in their lives? You know, they have yeah. parents helicoptering around them. You need to play football. You need to play soccer. You need to get good grades. You need to go to this college. And, and sometimes that's a little more subtle, and other times it's a little more overt. But I think a lot of bullying, just from, from what I saw in the places I worked, um, was about, or what I really experienced when I was in school in this case more, was uh, struggling to find some semblance of control over yeah. one's and, and, and And, you know, when you're really talking about empathizing with the bully, it usually, uh, people's first reaction is to go, oh, we're supposed to empathize with the victim immediately. And I've done the similar thing. So, uh, what, yesterday? All this shall be released on Thursday. But, yeah, so uh, I, was, I was doing this episode on soldiers, right, in which I was stating, you know, to state that you support the soldiers while being anti-war is, is an insane idea. You know, these people are murderers. They're terrible individuals. We shouldn't be really empathizing with him. And then uh, James, a.k.a. Puke from Puke in the Gang, actually called in, and he's part of the show as well, and kind of brought up his former army and everything else and kind of brought up all the different terrible things that kind of led a bunch of other people into joining this. And you kind of have to realize the fact that a lot of different things in, were involved in them becoming the person that they are right now, and it is that lack of control and the way that the military, in their particular case, kind of abducts and, and, and gets people to join up the military is in many, uh, a lot of times has to do with the preconditions that were created by the state in the first place. So because of a massive amount of regulations, there's no jobs in the town they're in, they're in public school, so they are never really shown how to do anything with their life. By the time they're 18, they don't know what the fuck's going on. They don't know how to do their own taxes to start a business. Yep. So you have the military go, hey, guess what? We can extend a uh, lack of re self-responsibility. You can join up with us, and we'll go travel the fucking world. Now, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder for people to believe that now due to the fact that we have the Internet so we can see the dronings and everything that happens. But you still have people in those back, you know, back ass or, uh, small towns where there's nothing, there's no real options. And in the case of bowling here, these kids have no real options as far as control is concerned. Yeah, I think we can, we can, especially with the, with the military people, uh, there's more empathy to go around than, than some people in our circle have, have let on, right? <laughs> it's like, they're, they're victims, and I, and I understand all the arguments that they're the tip of the spear, that it's their obedience that makes this possible. You know, I had a, I had a conversation with, um, you know, somebody who loves the military but hates Obama, loves the police but hates Obama. What is you know, I, and I asked them. I said, "What do you think Obama wants to do that that would be possible without them?" Yeah. You know, when it comes down to it. Who's pointing a gun to make uh, you know Obama's wishes, or you know, if that's your simplistic view of the world, that Obama wishes things and they become you know uh, inconveniences in your reality. Uh, who do you think makes that happen? So um, I I think that obviously. People have to be tricked into that, and I think that we we can empathize. I don't like it when I see people saying, oh, a cop got shot today. Good. Well, you know, the cop might have two kids, might have a wife, might have people that care about him or her in the community, so you're not, uh, that's not really good PR to be talking about how you're happy when, when people die. So, you know, I think on the one hand, there's empathy 
uh, we can we can empathize with just about anybody. Obviously, I guess there's probably a few exceptions, right? But we should also ask for personal responsibility from everybody, yeah. right? So in some cases, in, in, in the typical political and, and media world, there's no empathy and no responsibility. There's bad guys, there's the villains who get no empathy, and then there's the good guys who have no personal responsibility because they're victims, you know? So, I mean, I, I think that, that sometimes, um, you know, victims of bullying can be bullies too. Yeah. Uh, this is something. This is something that um, I forget why I first heard this. Nietzsche used to talk about this. That that victims seek bullies, right? Because they have their own way of bullying. They're like they've gone through all these same experiences. So just to kind of organize them as the victims of aggression, that somehow they're immune from all the consequences that the bullies suffer, or all these these angry feelings, or this trauma, or this aggression that the bullies want to act out. That's present in the victims, too. And if you really, really, really want to be honest about the situation and what people are dealing with, how they became this way, and get to the root of the situation, even though, yeah, that's not the easiest thing to say or to sell to people, that, yeah, sometimes victims of bullying are trying to use that uh, as a way of bullying themselves. And it doesn't mean that they're asking for it, you know, they're they're part of the same cycle. They're part of the same problem. They're in the same trap. So, to really uh, deal with that, I think we need to be able to look at what everybody's dealing with and trace it back to where it starts, which is yeah. the school environment, the family, treatment of children in society, and um, and then start moving forward again from there. If people really care about this. Yeah, and I think that's a kind of a good thing to end on. I just kind of wanted to bring up the fact as we've been kind of talking about here, which is the society's run on bullying. So how does the government work? It, it scares the shit out of you by propagating hatred and fear towards others. It exudes a hierarchical structure where those in government are to be trusted as gods and citizens. Well, the citizens, they must be regulated. They must be bullied. Parenting in America is very similar. Do as I say, not as I do. Do this because I love you. I hurt you because I love you. And of course, I hurt you because I care about you. And to enforce contradictions through force is the worst kind of bullying, which is what the government does. And, you know, we say kind of that a lot of times there's not enough empathy to go around, but again, there's not enough personal responsibility that's brought up. So how do we judge parents? Well, they're doing the best they can. Well, yeah, the government's bad, but politicians are doing the best they can. What do we do when a child is being abused at home, being filled with food-like substances that hinder brain development while being harassed by teachers and being looked down upon by society as a whole purely because, say, they weren't able to give the correct answer to 2x plus 4 equals 10, answer for x? Well, we tell him that he's wrong and then we fail him. What do we do when we stick him in a prison known as public school, throw him in a random aggregate of un uneducated masses to fend for himself? where he's not taught how to think but what to think, and then he decides to say fuck off to one of the other kids. Well, we call him a bully. The child has all the moral responsibility and none of the freedom. The politician has none of the moral responsibility and all of the freedom. When you remove a child's freedom, stick him in a prison, threaten him with psychotropic drugs, and then a surprise when he you know, strikes out with anger towards those who are even weaker than him, you know, you're being an idiot. Honestly, and you know there there are hundreds of thousands of children on psychotropic drugs because they're considered different than the norm. These drugs have a host of side effects and are detrimental to the individual sovereignty, will, and mind of children. But doctors, parents, and teachers are doing the best they can. The best they can nearly almost always means they're doing terrible shit, and we're going to justify it. Oh, that yeah. poor mother! She did the best they can when she hit her kid and kicked the dad out of the house because she didn't like him. I mean, the kids were so misbehaved all the time. What's a poor mother going to do? Well, yeah, Obama did some terrible shit, blew up some kids, decided to kill a, no a number of different individuals in different countries. But, you know, Bush left them really with no way to be able to do anything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, sure. you know, we wonder why children are bullies. Maybe it's because the world is run by bullies. A government campaign against bullying, and I've stated this before, is like running an anti-rape campaign that's funded by rape and run by a pro-rape lobby. 
And I know that's a rather hostile light way to kind of end this conversation, but I think it's something to keep in mind whenever we're talking about the subject of bullying in general is to empathize with what's actually occurring, actually absorbing the fact of what is the root cause in this issue, which Brett showed does so wonderfully. So, um, Brett, is there anything you kind of want to leave us with? No, I, I, I think that uh, this is the Truth Over Comfort podcast, so hostility should be welcome, you know. <laughs> And um, I, I uh, dug up that episode that we were talking about a little bit. It was uh, School Sucks Podcast number 184. It's called Youth Marketing, Old Tricks for New Generations. And the title of that film was um, Consuming Kids, the Commercialization of Childhood. Ooh, that's so, sexy. Yep. So my site is uh, schoolsucksproject.com, and if people are more interested uh, you know, in, in this topic, uh, or interested in more on this topic, you know, go to the front page and Google bullying, or check out the um, the Kids Are Not Defective series, which goes into this in much more detail. Absolutely. And for people who actually want to listen to this in podcast form, I'm having issues transferring everything to iTunes because I switched from Podomatic to SoundCloud. Go to Stitcher. Stitcher is better anyway. It streams better. It's You can just get it on your phone instantly. That is working beautifully. You can also go to the truthovercomfort.net page, and you can go to the SoundCloud page there. You can download directly, which I'm trying to throw as much stuff out there as I can so everybody can kind of get informed of these issues. I'm also doing the True Objective Live on Mondays with Lauren Rumpler, so you can check that out. And this show is going to be on the Voluntary Virtues Network, which will be I'll be having a live show. Hopefully it'll be live later on. Thursdays at 7 p.m. So definitely check that out. And again, schoolsucksproject.com. Uh, and by the way, I'll be speaking on uh, the Friday for Porkfest. So check that out. That'll be in Lancaster, New Hampshire. So uh, definitely check that out, folks. Again, truthovercomfort.net. And thank you so much for listening.